Uh, all right. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I, I, as you can hear from the uh, introduction, I, I'm not from the social sector, but I think uh, I work in what we call like an, an adjacent sector. Uh, but uh, data and AI, they are um, capabilities that kind of cut across. So I do hope that we can uh, learn from each other. And again, uh, thanks very much for this opportunity to, to share with, uh, with all of you. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't want to uh, to make any assumptions. So before today, uh, like any good uh, like data person, I went to collect some data. So I went to uh, speak to some friends who are in social services. And also um, my friends I've known over the years when I talk to them about technology, uh, I get a number of uh, phrases. So this is uh, totally anonymized, but uh, I just want to like, empathize with a lot of the things that I, I'm hearing. Um, we have thoughts like, you know, um, where do I start? And you know, uh, sometimes you talk about these like high level concepts, but you know, in my team, it's just me. Uh, and also, you know, um, uh, I don't want to let these things take my my time and effort and focus away from my patients and families. And also, um, there is some uh, rightful um, uh, caution in trying to transfer ideas from a tech industry where you have ideas like, oh, I want to move fast and break things, and transferring them to the social sector. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I just want to, to acknowledge that um, I, I hear all of these things. And so um, in doing the session today, I uh, have kind of structured it such that we are able to uh, like a bit of a buffet. So um, uh, you can just pick and choose the, the topics that are most relevant to you. And I hope that you'll uh, get something transferable out of this session. Uh, quick instruction of, of myself. Um, I think it's always very awkward when I hear uh, Bruce or, or anyone just introduce me based on, on what is written. Uh, but uh, I think I've been on a, a lifelong uh, search to find an intersection between uh, technology and people. And uh, there was no such, um, there was no such uh, university degree. So people talk about STEM and, and arts and social science, but um, when I was in school, there was no such thing. So um, I, I started in computing and then over the course of my, my career, I, I kept um, going back to school, eventually going back to school uh, four times until I have, uh, until I spend like most of my savings on like um, trying to find that uh, elusive intersection or people uh, and technology. Uh, but I, I think, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, very much the way that the world is, uh, is now. And I think the social sector has uh, a lot to contribute to the tech sector and I hope to see uh, more of that going forward. Uh, my main role is uh, I lead um, an AI team in MSD, uh, as well as I'm a global SME for embedding ethical behavior and policies and processes into the company. Um, in terms of uh, data collection, uh, my brother and I, we also co-founded a startup called Loretta.io, where we do uh, human behavior analytics in a way that doesn't use uh, facial recognition and um, it's like privacy first. And also I, I co-authored uh, Singapore's uh, AI ethics and governance body of knowledge. Um, I, I do write a lot online. And so my kind of my Medium account is also there if anyone um, follows Medium. So uh, the four topics I'm going to cover today, uh, and, and again, this is designed to like uh, pick and choose on what's most uh, relevant. Uh, the first one is uh, on the team of Lego and being a master builder. Uh, the first one is uh, thinking about data value. Uh, the second one is designing data orgs and teams. The third is uh, running a data program. And uh, the fourth is, I think, uh, kind of a, a longer term, slightly philosophical view of, um, of ethical uh, AI and, and what we can do with data in the years ahead. Another way to look at it is it uh, depends uh, who you are and uh, who's, what the role that's most relevant for you in the organization. Um, the first one would be like uh, if you are responsible for strategy. The second one is you, if you are part of a team or leading a team. The third one is you're a, a product or program manager. Uh, and I think the fourth one is quite universally uh, relevant to everyone. So feel free. I, I know that half an hour is quite long uh, in this uh, kind of like environment of of like notifications and all these things. So feel free to like filter in and out as you need to. Uh, to start, to start with this simple idea, uh, I just want to take a step back and, you know, uh, just for all of us to reflect how data and AI is already uh, embedded everywhere in our lives. Uh, from left to right, you have uh, Spotify, Netflix, you have uh, the stuff that goes behind every ATM transaction. Uh, uh, we have uh, assisted parking, we have, um, uh, Siri slash Alexa, depending on uh, which brand you prefer. And you actually have, um, I believe this uh, a synthetic uh, deepfake uh, TV presenter. 
So um, these things are uh, all powered at some level with uh, data and AI, and they're already a part of our lives. But how is this uh, relevant to, to us as, a, as an organization? Um, <clears throat> in thinking about data, uh, I, I saw that you know, of the, the five uh, priorities, this is the one that talks about data and insights. But I think uh, my heart is also to say that, you know, um, I believe everyone's already doing like a lot of things and um, having another dozen things on top of what you're already doing is always, is always not so uh, fun for anyone. Uh, so I think I urge everyone to not just use, not just do extra stuff in data and AI, but also use it to, to, help, to help your work, automate your work and, and take care of yourselves. So for, from left to right, um, the way we think about use cases in data, we have uh, analytics and insights and personalization, which is the far left. Uh, we use it to understand our clients, our patients, our employees, our customers, and so on. Uh, in the middle, we don't just use data for insights, but we also use data to train models that automate and augment the work that we do. Uh, and on the right, sometimes um, you know, um, data and AI just changes the way we do things. So it's like a, something that's totally new that is not in the way that we've worked before. If anyone works in finance, um, you might, uh, sense this feels very familiar. Uh, another way you look at it is um, I, I boost my top line, I boost my bottom line, or I create a new like kind of a line item, right? So um, more impact, more efficiency, or, or do new things. So I think, uh, you know, uh, much as I believe uh, we will be going into a deep dive onto uh, like insights and data and so on, I just want to uh, broaden our perspective that um, uh, yeah, the scope of data can be quite broad and you can use it quite creatively. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if uh, you noticed, but actually uh, the previous slide was uh, already categorized in just these uh, three uh, segments. So um, Spotify and Netflix are actually like personalization recommendation engines on the far left. Uh, in the middle, uh, ATMs, the top one is like an automated teller whereas the bottom one is an augmented workflow, where it's like you work side by side with uh, some kind of intelligent technology. And I think uh, these, both these modes of, um, of, of deployment do help uh, increase efficiencies of our operations. And finally, uh, new capabilities like uh, virtual agents and uh, synthetic uh, data on the far right. And uh, bringing it back to Lego, right? So um, uh, I think I want to pick up on this idea of uh, data storytelling, insights and personalization. Um, I actually do have a number of friends who work in uh, data science within uh, charity and social sector. Uh, one big thing they use is uh, for fundraising optimization. And um, I think um, after like years of wrangling with like forms and ERPs and so on, they use uh, NLP. Uh, for text insights. So you're able to make sense of large quantities of unstructured information on the far left. Uh, in the middle, as we come to automation augmentation, uh, I think in interacting with, uh, with like a human being, uh, it's very hard to both talk as well as type. So uh, automated transcription has now, has very recently uh, crossed a threshold that you're able to have it almost side by side in real time. And so I think that's very promising. Uh, and also in terms of the many, many uh, office workflows that we have on multiple systems, uh, RPA uh, with a human in a loop is a good, good example of how we can automate some of those things. Uh, and on the far right, I think um, uh, there are many things that are very custom to every, um, every situation, every industry. And I think a couple that I've encountered is um, uh, we might want to consider training a local language, maybe dialect, virtual assistants, uh, as well as um, like new modalities where um, we have a fairly affordable uh, off-the-shelf models to assist in OT and speech therapy and so on. So uh, again, I'm no expert and I don't, uh, don't pretend to be, but I think um, just to share uh, that there's a lot you can do, uh, not just for insights, but also to kind of like improve and, and um, uh, automate things that are kind of like uh, holding us back from our patients and, and our, our clients. Uh, so, so much for that kind of a high level view. Uh, I'm going to just switch channel and talk a bit about people. Uh, so data ops and teams. Uh, I believe uh, Kelvin in the next uh, session will be going to a bit more detail in this. So I'll try to make this uh, one uh, quite short. Um, I only have two slides on this. And the first is um, if you are uh, an organization, uh, what do you build in the organization and what do you build in headquarters and what do you build somewhere in between? So I think this is that kind of like uh, sector-wide design kind of question. 
So um, I think um, uh, the principle is uh, the closer to the end user, um, the closer you want decision support to be, okay? So um, there's no need to have a large, to, to, to like hire an IT person if you are uh, spending most of your time with patients. Uh, at the same time, is there's no need to hire a whole bunch of uh, user experience and uh, data scientists and psychologists if you are all the way at the back working on like data platforms. Um, from um, top to bottom, I'm just gonna the, cover the left first and the right. From top to bottom, um, closer to the, to the person, you want to be doing uh, decision support, uh, modeling, uh, dashboards, and consumers of products. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you want to do things that are cross-organizational um, and maybe like emerging specialist capability. So uh, for myself, my AI team is considered fairly specialist, fairly niche. So there's no need to have a machine learning engineer in every single organization. Uh, these are like kind of central incubated specialist capabilities. And somewhere in between, uh, you have a technology that is specific to a single organization. Uh, to give examples of each on the right, um, you might have an analyst working on their machine, maybe using open source all the way uh, in, in, in any organization. And these are skills that we uh, tend to teach. Um, like for instance, um, one of our most popular courses is um, uh, I think a two hour course where we use um, like a, uh, an open source software to, to automate Excel. So you know, these are kinds of things you do all the way um, in organizations. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, we, we don't really need a um, hundred different procurement people to go and buy, to go and negotiate and buy like one license at a time. Uh, those are things that we handle uh, centrally. Uh, we also do things like um, not building like a dozen chatbots, but building a single chatbot platform for each agency to just like uh, launch their own chatbot without any IT support and so on. So I think just to give a flavor of um, the central and decentralization, uh, close to tech versus close to, close to customer. Um, the second diagram is, uh, I think, the skills future ICT skills uh, framework. Um, so myself and some of my peers, we worked on this uh, map of roles in data and AI. And um, uh, I won't dwell on this one because I think this will be covered in the next talk, but I will leave you with, uh, with three questions based on uh, people I have spoken to who wanted to get into this field. So if anyone wants to get to this field, but not sure uh, what JD to, to apply to, here are three questions. Uh, the first question is, um, do, you, are you, do you primarily work on dashboarding tools? Is it uh, Tableau, Click, Spotfire, Cognos, um, R Shiny, or so on? Uh, if that's the case, uh, the roles are really under the far left, what we call business intelligence. So if you uh, Google like uh, um, data scientists, uh, where, where you are looking for business intelligence, there'll probably be a mismatch there. Um, second one is um, people have asked me, do I need a PhD to work in data, uh, to work in data science, to work in AI? Uh, well, yes, only if you, you need to publish technical research and that is on the far right in applied research. So um, uh, this is probably not relevant to the majority of us, including most people in my team. I've only met those roles in uh, people who publish algorithms for other companies to consume. So uh, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, and so on. So for, the most, for most of us, uh, the answer is no. And that's the applied research field as well. Um, uh, we have quite a few of those in, in big tech as well. And maybe the, the most uh, uh, common question is, do I, how much IT do I need to know? How much programming do I need to know? And that I think the question we can ask is, well, uh, is your work consumed by a person or is it consumed by a system? So if it's consumed by a person, you're probably um, looking at this line, you're probably like in data science. If it's consumed by a system, it's really around uh, engineering, whether you're doing the pipelining or actual modeling. Uh, another way to think about it is that, um, are you mostly services? Um, I believe um, uh, we have uh, some consultants who are working with, uh, with, the, uh, with some of your organizations and those are uh, professional services, data science. Or are they like uh, product people who work for um, Shopee, Grab, Lazada, Tencent, so on? Uh, so uh, services are here and products are here. All right. So uh, just a high level overview. And I think that this will be going be, there'll be a bit more detail on this in the next talk. Uh, for my third section, I'm just going to do a quick check on time. Yep. 
Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about if you are a project manager or program manager uh, who is really experienced, uh, but maybe uh, you are new to, you've done lots of programs or maybe not a data or AI program. So that's uh, this one. And so we ask the question, what makes these um, projects different? Okay. So with that, let me just give an example and maybe you can um, uh, get our minds a bit uh, thinking and engaged as well. Let's say I ask you this question, if I show you a photo, you've not seen this photo yet, but I'll show you a photo of a person, uh, how accurately can you predict a person's age? Can you predict to five years, 10 years, one year, six months? Uh, does it depend on whether it's uh, an Asian or not an Asian? Um, think about this question. And this question is relevant because that's where lots of uh, analytics questions are like, um, you have not even seen the data, but then in a, as a project manager, you need to predict um, how feasible it is, what's the business case, what the, uh, what the requirements are, and so on. Um, at, at this point in time, we don't even know whether the project is feasible. We don't know what's the right approach. Do I get a statistician in? Do I get a machine learning person in? We're not sure. Uh, and the, I think the main question is, we don't know whether there's enough information in the data for the result to be useful enough, right? Uh, let's say that uh, you know um, I need it to be uh, accurate to three years before it's useful, but we don't know whether it's accurate to two years or 10 years. And so we don't really know whether the product's even feasible uh, at this point in time. So I think uh, I want us to wrestle with this sense of uncertainty that's quite unique uh, to, to like uh, looking at these like data and, and modeling projects. Um, th there is an answer to this question and um, state of the art uh, is, uh, models can actually predict accuracy to 2.3 years. Uh, it is quite an interesting um, uh, algorithm where they found that the most predictive thing of your age is uh, actually the corner of your eye and nothing else. It's not the color of your hair, uh, the, the, the shape of your face, it's literally the corner of your eye. And based on that, the algorithm can predict your age to 2.3 years. So um, this is not a commercial for, for, for makeup, but I think uh, it's just to, to bring across the idea that um, uh, there's always this sense of uncertainty that's unique to two data projects, and you won't know until you try. Uh, for those of you who are a bit uh, uh, like mathematically inclined, uh, there is a formula. So you can think of the value of one of these uh, data science or AI pro projects as uh, not just the, the business value of it, but also depends on the data quality. And I do know that you know um, the data quality in the sector is often um, like not so good, and so that's something we definitely need to consider. But besides data quality, we also need to look, think about the predictive signal. So no matter how good the quality is, if the sig if um, um, the you're not able to predict to the sufficient accuracy, um, then everything kind of falls apart. If any time goes to zero, the value goes to zero. So to mitigate this, if you are tasked with a project or a program to lead, um, do it uh, split it into two, right? take a small team to assess the data quality and predictive signal. Uh, and then after that, bring in the rest of the team to scale. It's better to fail with like one person in, in two weeks than like 10 people in six months, right? It's a very just simple principle. Um, I also want to make a quick uh, distinction between um, some of the, the analytics versus some of the, the uh, I guess, uh, like what falls under the AI umbrella. And uh, often I see um, like articles talking about this maturity of descriptive to predictive to prescriptive. Uh, but I think I want to make a different distinction, which is that all these things assume there is an analyst or human in the loop. But I think um, some of these other things, um, whether it's RPA, whether it's chatbots, whether it's a robot, uh, this, it's not about the sophistication of the analytics. It's about the autonomy of the execution. So, you know, on the left, this is usually a data scientist and analyst talking about uh, doing some data storytelling. Whereas when you think about things like, like a robot, whether it's like a physical robot or whether it's like a chatbot, uh, it's not about the analytics. It's about the fact that this is, there's no human behind the, the, uh, that program. And this brings with it like so many other, other issues, right? So I think that's like just a second distinction as you think about how to manage these projects. To give an example, uh, a GPS uh, helps a human make a decision, but a self-driving car is driving on your behalf. Uh, 
uh, forecasting on maybe like the load for uh, for next year is a is a gives you it's about human insights. But when we buy something from Lazada or Shopee, uh, there is no one behind um, approving every single advertisement uh, that comes to us. That's like an automated recommendation engine. And I think uh, these two modalities, they require uh, different types of project management skills. So in summary, um, the, the two things that are kind of specific to this kind of work is uh, the data uncertainty and the uh, autonomous decision making. Uh, and, and to mitigate it, uh, I'll just repeat what I said just now, nothing new here. Um, we, we tend to start with like, oh, tell me your requirements and I'll deliver according to your requirements. But um, this is not so much a good idea in data and AI projects. Uh, rather, we do this, we do a small project to make sure it works before we do a second phase to scale it up. Uh, we've had a very, very good hit rate uh, with this kind of approach versus uh, uh, kind of a classic, um, tell me what you want, let me sign it off and, and, and kind of like delivering based on, on the sign off kind of approach. So uh, if you just take away one thing from, from this, this part of the session is that um, we often chop up our, our data and AI projects into two parts, uh, first a pilot or POC, and then a scaling phase to maximize the chance of success. All right, so, um, <clears throat> Uh, wrapping up, I think I just want to uh, leave some like longer term thoughts with everyone. Uh, and so I actually wrote this um, a few chapters of uh, our, our AI ethics um, uh, body of knowledge for Singapore, and it's really around human centricity and the ethical use of uh, data and AI. So I'll just like uh, take a couple of ideas from that. Um, to make it a bit more real, I will start by asking this other question, which is uh, have a thing, right? Um, how much would you pay uh, for a self-driving car? Is it less than 25,000, 25 to 50,000, 50, 75,000, 75 to 100,000, more than 100,000? So um, two things should jump out to you, to, to observing people. Uh, firstly, that this doesn't amount to 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 one hundred percent. Secondly, this is probably not Singapore because <laughs> where got where got the uh, car so cheap in Singapore, right? Um, but actually, uh, as of uh, this poll, which is actually a couple of years old, fully half the population would never ever step in a self driving car because of trust. Um, and bring it back into to the present, um, there are these two uh, factors in tension. On one hand, we have uh, programs like what we're going through now. Data is good, analytics is good, AI is good. These things are strategic on the left. In fact, um, uh, with a big number here, 83% of adopters say AI, not even analytics, but AI will be very critically important within the next two years. But in that same breath, that same poll is like 95%, okay, um, we have some concerns, right? We have some concerns. So we have the value, but we have the concerns and we need to um, take care of both of these things in tension. Um, I also mentioned that uh, as we talk about AI ethics and um, like governance and some of these like, ideas, uh, there's like many, many things um, under, uh, under the umbrella. Uh, I, I won't go into this, but just to share that, you know, over the, the months and years, I had a couple of team members, like every time they encounter uh, a new kind of incident, they tried to categorize it and like put it under like, uh, like this diagram. And depending on who you are, whether you are a technical AI team like ours, we have a whole bunch of issues here. If you are the, um, uh, the leader of an organization, you have like, you know, governance, you have new processes, you have new consent, you have new automation uh, frameworks and all these things. Uh, at a national level, we think about um, uh, landscapes of, of, of automation and skill loss um, and living in an environment where we're not sure truth is anymore, and, and we even get into some uh, pretty uh, far-flung existential issues as we talk about you know, some of the, the newest um, advances of AI. So there's a lot under the, the, the framework. Uh, and I just want to put a diagram here for your maybe like reference. And if anyone's interested, happy to dive into any of these things uh, offline. Um, and also there's a lot of work in, in fixing it. So uh, in that same survey that I sent you, uh, while many teams are adopting increasingly advanced um, data and analytics uh, up till AI, 
uh, most companies are kind of like operating at risk and um, um, even trying to address the pipeline in terms of a new graduates, uh, there's like a lot of work to do, okay? And I think this is where I think uh, our walls kind of collide because um, as I looked at what the, the government, what the PDPC was, uh, was proposing, uh, I did have some uh, input into some of these uh, frameworks, but I think these are things that um, are very intuitive uh, and I think areas where the social services have a lot of expertise in. So I believe the social services sector is a very uniquely positioned to contribute to the future of ethical technology. Uh, as we think about um, how do you make um, decisions made by systems uh, explainable uh, and fair uh, to people who are uh, underrepresented, who may not be able to, to understand some of these um, like, you know, uh, concepts that require like, you know, a certain level of, of sophistication and education. Um, things that, you know, uh, like making your systems human centric, how do you, uh, how do you communicate to like diverse types of, uh, of stakeholders uh, who may not be in the kind of like the, the large median of the population uh, and, and so on. So uh, I, I think um, as I view the evolution of this field in, in Singapore, uh, I, I would invite anyone who is interested to, uh, to collaborate. So um, as of the end of this year, I believe uh, Singapore is about to roll out uh, some accreditation frameworks so that um, students from next year will be able to bring some of that human-centric view into, um, in, into their thinking as they, as they train in, in, in data and AI degrees and in uh, in ITE, in poly, in universities, and so on. Uh, and I think um, there are groups uh, such, such as the SES and IMDA who are looking for collaborators, right? So if there's anyone uh, on this call who would like to uh, step forward and volunteer and maybe uh, do your part to uh, embed, bring some of the expertise of the social sector and embed it with some of these um, like future um, like uh, uh, frameworks and uh, uh, and, 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 and operational models on the way we, we, we scale up data and AI in Singapore, uh, please get in touch with me and I'll, I'll link you up with the, the right groups. Um, yeah, um, I just wanted to, uh, to end with a couple of examples. Uh, one of the most uh, common reactions I get when I tell them I'm working on AI is that, are you creating a robot to take away my job? And um, this example is actually from Japan. And uh, uh, while the, the robot on the left is, is a, a robot waiter that, can, that could potentially uh, replace uh, a human waiter, uh, the designers uh, who are very, I think, uh, like socially minded, they actually designed it such that it was uh, remotely piloted by a paraplegic. So instead of taking a job away from a person, it brought a person back into the workforce. These are ideas that you know uh, were not very apparent at all to the the engineering team, and I think it was that spark of a design compassion uh, from from this group that I think um, um, made this uh, particular project go the direction that it did. I think uh, you know uh, many people in, in your field. Uh, there's a lot that you can contribute to, kind of like uh, bend the trajectory of technology in a way that benefits the world. Um, I, I did mention that I do uh, quite a lot of uh, like writing. And so my, my last slide is um, this question, which I, I answered online. What's my career goal for the next 10 years? And, uh, you know, uh, lots of the things that we do in data and AI are just um, amplifying the visions of the designer. So I think uh, the question is not how, how good I can make it, but the question is uh, what direction I'm taking it. Uh, these um, AI systems are just optimizing, optimization tools. And I think uh, the takeaway is, um, are we optimizing in the direction we want? Are we optimizing towards the world we want? And yeah, I'll leave you with that, with, with that talk. Uh, this is my last slide. And I think I'm also just at time. So um, with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Kelvin. <laughs>